I'm happy to be with you here today. Uh, the first part of the talk will be about um, uh, what we call evolution, or what's new, what's new in evolution these days. And in the second half of the talk, there, there will be some general considerations about uh, um, what are requirements for a good classifications, a good classification in science in general. And we will finish with the relationship between classification and evolution, which is a, a complicated relationship. <laughs> it has been complicated during the history of, uh, of science, and it's still complicated, actually. What do we understand under what do we as a normal persons I would I would say I wouldn't think right from the beginning about scientists but common people how do you how do they think about evolution what do they understand under this word um, evolution is often understood as a story to tell uh, sometimes based on a scala nature, you know, this scale of beings, this a kind of piling of uh, organisms from the less complex to the most complex, and you can guess the most complex is obviously us, it's ourselves. Uh, in, in its worst version, it's, uh, it's a story to tell based on something from the primitive for, to, to something from the uh, evolved. Sometimes you can find uh, conferences which titles uh, could which title could be evolution, comma, uh, from bacteria to, to humans, <laughs> something very primitive to something very uh, very uh, supposedly uh, uh, complex and evolved. And in, in the best situation, this the story to tell is based on a tree, which is not a, a scale. But a tree is, uh, is uh, more complex. There is a, a dimension of relationship in a tree which is not in, in the scale. Um, you can understand evolution as a process of change of living lineages through time. You can understand evolution as a progress. Some, sometimes, there, they, often, there is, a, 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 there is a, a link between this view of evolution when you see a scale and the notion of progress. It has been very strong during the, the, the second half of the 19th century to the middle 20th century. Uh, there, was a, there were a mix between the scala nature and the notion of progress. Uh, if you go from the most simple organism to the most complex ones, it was understood implicitly. Evolution was understood as a progress towards uh, more complex things and obviously the humans were at the top. Uh, evolution can be understood also as a theory used by several sciences, uh, biology first obviously, paleontology, anthropology and there are some others, uh, the theoretical uh, understanding of, uh, of, the, of the term. We as scientists put more emphasis on this uh, notion of evolution. We see it mostly, first of all, we see it as a th theoretical framework into which you, 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 you will understand changes, uh, short-term changes in agronomy, for instance, or long-term changes in paleontology. Evolution will be uh, a, th a theory, uh, allowing us to, to interpret um, uh, biological entities and also fossil entities, also uh, human societies. And ob it's, it's more or less um, here um, relinked to what we call the patterns, the distribution of attributes across the variety of organisms or biological entities, the distribution of attributes and uh, the sharing of attributes, the sharing of characters, uh, is understood as a pattern uh, of evolution. Here you, are, you have more processes of evolution, a process of change, uh, the process by which uh, the biological lineages are going to change. As in many sciences, we do have these two epistemological frameworks. You see the world through patterns, what is it? Where, what, where does it come from? Who is sharing what with whom? 
the patterns and the processes. How can it proceed? How can it happen? How can it occur? This is a how and here this is a what is it and where, where does it come from? There is evolution is in your mind and in all our mind, minds uh, is entering a, a, into a, a cultural uh, framework and for many of our citi citizens evolution has to be understood within a cultural heritage and our cultural heritage is not really compatible to what evolution has to explain scientifically from, from the, from the, for the bi biological world. Most of the time evolution is counterintuitive. Why evolution is counterintuitive? Because we don't see, first of all, your grandmother or your grandfather don't see any, any cat giving birth to anything else than cats. Mother cats make baby cats. I don't see evolution uh, uh, every day. Living things look like designed. Uh, forms seems to be uh, seems to fit the function we know for forms, and you know we are accustomed to these ideas that when, when you when you face a, a, a perfect fit between form and function, for us, for all of us, this is because the the form has been anticipated to fit with the function we were wanting we were we were uh, wanting it to 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 be uh, performed. So for us, we are creatures that, that uh, generate tools. And when we generate tools, we anticipate f functions to occur and we determine forms for the function to be uh, uh, accomplished, to be achieved. In, in evolution, it is the reverse. Uh, function is not anticipated. Form is just what is it and if its, its form is here it's because in the past uh, function was the, the performance by which the form was maintained. So there, there is no design at all. It's very difficult for us to imagine that you can have a, an equation between form and function without design. And it is very strong uh, barrier, a very strong uh, um, difficulty for our public to admit evolution because if there is a fit between form and function, it is, bec it is because the forms has been designed for it, Pur purposefully, I mean. Um, you have this idea uh, among our public that humans are not animals at all and there is very strong obviously religious heritage about that um, the, the, the three main monotheisms organize a cut a separation between what is a human and what an animal is and you have to choose you are either an animal or an, a human but you can be both in our cultural heritage evolution says the contrary you are both an animal and a human. We will see how. Nature is perfect. You can still have this kind of, of, of consideration in biomimicry today. If you look at some American websites uh, promoting biomimicry, that start from the point, for, for, start from right from the beginning, they start from the point of view that nature is, is necessarily perfect. And uh, perfect, perfection is not a scientific notion, obviously. So evolution has nothing to do with perfection. Evolution with, will tell you how things work and sometimes why things don't, don't work. Nature is... Performance is, is not a, an absolute value. Performance is, a, is something you have... Um, uh, it's, it's a continuous uh, variable, I mean. And one of the main uh, obstacles we have in the reception of evolution by our public is that um, in our heritage from monotheisms, groups are real. Groups are causal. And you often f find people thinking that 
Cats have fur because they are mammals. The group is causal. The group to which you belong is the cause why you have the things you have. In science, it's the contrary. In science, cats are mammals because they have fur. So there is an inversion of causality in most of our mind comparing to what evolution has to teach you about the scientific point of view of what natural creatures are. Unfortunately, school children don't hear about evolution because in France at least, in France, school children don't hear about evolution before the age of 10 or 11 years old. And it's a difficulty in my own uh, profession, it's my own job, it's a difficulty to to, um, to try to um, fix this problem is that we should teach evolution as early as possible. As early as possible, it means speaking about evolution of elements of evolution starting from six to seven years old. It's possible. It's, uh, it's just a matter of being uh, audacious in terms of pedagogy, being uh, if you, if you feel uh, co um, confident with uh, the, the, the background and the pedagogy you have to, you have to invent, uh, it's possible to do the job. But it, it's, it's not the case because, it, you know, school systems are big machines and it's, <laughs> it's not so, so, so easy to, to change. But it's not a matter of intrinsic uh, impossibility, epistemological or pedagogical difficulty. There's no, no difficulties of this kind. We, we are able to imagine pedagogic solutions to, to, for, 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 for school children to hear about evolution as early as possible. Unfortunately, I will be back at the end about that. Unfortunately, they, they are taught about classification before being taught about evolution. But in science, evolution fixes the program of classification. If I can make it short, in science, Evolution makes classification, but at school you, you, you learn classification before you hear about evolution. So there, there is a complexity, pedagogical and sociological complexity uh, about that. We will be back on that later. This relationship between uh, classification and evolution is managed by a science that is called the systematics. Systematics is the science of classifications. This is a science which manages consistent links between objects, real objects, concepts and names. And this relationship has to be as consistent as possible. It's not only a matter of giving a name to a, to a specimen. This specimen is just a single uh, individual. I mean, it doesn't represent the world by itself unless you make it you, you, you construct a concept around it. And a concept has a geometry. So you have, to, you have both to manage the geometry of the concept, the word you, you, you put on it, and the reference specimen somewhere. Otherwise, if you don't have a reference specimen somewhere, you know, biological world is, is changing. Whatever you do, the biological world is changing. So if you find a fly and you, you, a new fly and you describe it in a paper, uh, you give a new name for the new fly and you, if you forget to put a, a, an individual of the fly in, in a collection at a museum, sooner or later you, you even won't know what, what was it about because uh, pop fly populations change very, very fast. Or else uh, you could go back to the, to the place and the landscape has changed and the fly has just disappeared. So you, you, you don't know wh what was it. So you need reference collections to, to make this triangle work. This is the reason why there are museums with, with uh, co sp collection specimens. At the Museum of Natural History in Paris, we have 16, 18, no, excuse me, eight, 68, millions, <laughs> 68 millions of specimens working like a kind of dictionary of nature. Uh, you have to, to maintain the consistency of names because things are changing always. And indeed, we have to, man we have to face change. And there, they, there, there has always been a, a difficult uh, relationship between the stability of the names, the stability of the concepts, 
And the things that we designate with these concepts, the things that are changing, and the example I can give you here is a very simple one. This guy from this stage, 17 years old, to this stage, 60, uh, 75 years old, uh, he has replaced all his cells. He has replaced all his matter. So, what makes this individual here the same as the one that is here? Is it the same or not the same? From the, if science is about describing a material world and rationally and collectively explaining this material world, if you follow the movements of matter, obviously this guy and this one is, are not the same anymore. They have replaced all these matters. Giving the same name to, from this step to this step is just a convention. It's just conventional. Um, I will, his name is Michel Simon, if you know him. I don't know if you know him, but uh, I think you know him. <laughs> Excuse me. I know him too. No, not personally. But, uh, <laughs> So I, I could have decided to, to give uh, a, a name to this step, different than the name at this step, different at the name at this step. This is what happens in some uh, popula human populations of the Indian subcontinent. They decide to give an, a different name from the ki for the kid, the, the teenager, and, uh, and the adult. It's just a convention. So names you put on things are conventional. It, it depends how, what, what are the geometries of the concept you are constructing. The French policy has a geometry of concepts this, that decides to give the same name from the, from the birth to the death. So it, the name of, the, of, of this entity will be Michel Simon from the beginning until the end. But we, we could have decided oh, oh, uh, in, in, in a different way. So it, it goes to the question and very, very old philosophical questions that when it changes, was it changing actually? It's a question that was uh, already uh, uh, in the philosopher's mind in the Greek uh, on, uh, antiquity. Um, if I'm describing the world precisely following the movements of matter, uh, I can't speak about nature anymore because I will be uh, 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 obligated to give a name to each day of this guy because he replaced his matter every, every day. He it loses carbon uh, atoms, it loses oxygen atoms, it, it replaced cells. So it's not the same from one day to another. Uh, if you push until the end, you, 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 are, you, you will be obliged to give a, a di different name every minute. So you can't say anything about the guy if you have a different name every minute because it changes every minute. You understand? Okay. So there is a tension between the, need, the stability of language and the, the way the, the, the world is, is changing. And systematics is a nego permanent negotiation between the need for stability of our language in one side and the changing world on the other side. So I can do by bio any biology by giving us a surname for each tree or each bird I meet. I, I need words of some general extent, you know what I mean. So I have to negotiate about change. When I, when I need to speak, I have to negotiate about, about change. When uh, giving the name of Michel Simon to this guy from his birth to his death. In the, in, in the language, I, I'm hiding the fact that he is changing. It's a convention. What do you see here? Raise your hand if you see change. Ten people. Raise your hand if you see similarity. A little bit more. Okay. Do you see change or do you see similarity? This is the, the big question. <laughs> Sorry? Both. 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 Yes, yeah, some, some people would say, would say both, indeed. <laughs> and um, there, there, this tension has, has been in the history of biology and history of natural history right from the beginning. Um, if, if I'm 
without telling all the story, I don't have the time for this, but uh, if you take Linnaeus uh, b at the beginning of the 18th century, Linnaeus uh, was inclined to neglect variation, to neglect change, and focus on stability. So Linnaeus see one species here. Only one species, one thing. He sees one thing, and variation is um, is considered is considered as um, 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 corruption, material corruption of the ideal plan of God, of creation. So w what was important is that all these animals looks like each other because they were created by the hand of God. Uh, because God created all species, actually. Species were real for, for, for Linnaeus. It was a direct expression of, the, of God's will. In a world that, that was, there, were, there was no evolution in that, in that kind of thinking. Uh, so it is what we call idealism. Idealism, the, the, the category, the box you, you are producing in your mind, as the has an ont ontological priority over the individuals that uh, uh, represent it. So these individuals are linked to the category that, that transcends them, you know. They are linked with the category, with an essence, an essence they, they have inside. You are, you are a woman, you wash the dish. You are a man, you repair the, the engine of the car. This is essentialism. You cannot escape from it. You are prisoner of the category into which someone else put you. Okay? To make it short. Uh, Darwin, one century later, uh, was rather inclined to see 24 things here. Because he paid attention to variation. He paid attention to change. So, uh, Categories made for thinking nature and naming nature. Categories were considered as conventional. This is what we call nominalism. What, what exists in our species do not exist. Birds do not exist. Insects do not exist. Th these names are given to boxes and these boxes are in our mind. Here outside there are just individuals. So you can say there is no birds outside there. Birds, it, it's a clade containing more than 10,000 species. So there, there, there was some, I mean, some reasons why we did that, that box. And we will see that. But this, it's just a box to be able to rationally speak about nature with general concept. Because as, as I said, we, we cannot do any biology by giving a an individual surname to any, to any fly or any worm we found there. Okay. So this tension is, as I com I, um, came along with, uh, with uh, the next centuries in, in that way, uh, I, I will summarize it by this kind of framework. If you see here similarity, is similarity is a given. So you need to explain change. And it was not the deal of Linnaeus, because for Linnaeus there was no change at all. <laughs> so he was uh, con self-consistent about that, you know. But for Ernst Mayer in the 20th century, it, it, it was a, a, a big deal. I have been talked when I was at school that Natural selection explains how species change. And this is what you have been learned. This is what you, you learned in, at school. If similarity is a given, uh, you have to explain change. If you see change here, what you have is, is if change is a given, if, if you are conscious that the real world we are looking at, the real world that science is trying to explain is permanently changing, you have to explain similarity. Why do these individuals look looks like each other? 
So this is a very important framework to understand the, the, what, what, what occurred between the, the 19th century and the 20th century. Why, the way I was taught evolution, why was it um, in, under, the, under the, 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 main, the main deal, uh, natural selection ha explains how species change. While, if I go back to the 19th century, when I read Darwin, the question is the reverse one. Why did Mayer put a question that is the reverse question of Darwin's question? Darwin's question is what? Everything, changing, everything is changes at all scales, at the chemical and physical scale. It's, it's, it's not a scoop, uh, actually. Uh, so what, what do we ha do? How do I obtain similarity while the, the world is changing? Why, why did Mayer put it differently than Darwin? So we will answer that question a little bit later. So <clears throat> going back to evolution, um, in the two uh, schemes you have here, you, you finish at the end by a picture of stability. Here, these uh, circles symbolize individuals and the builders finish to, to, to have the same color. For Lamarck, uh, 1809, uh, individuals of a population had to, uh, in a way, survive, had to survive and make efforts to be able to, uh, to get the, what, what they need for. When you are doing efforts, you uh, increase organs. Obviously, if you stimulate your muscles, your muscles are going to, to grow. It's, it's, a, it's just a, a, the observation of, of a physician. Lamarck is looking at living things with the eye of a physician, you know, in a way. He's, he's, he's looking at how, what happened at the scale of the population, but also what happens at the scale of the variation that occurs. He tries to explain in the, same, in the same time the initiation of variation and it, its resulting uh, uh, effects at the scale of the population. So the individuals are making efforts, so they stimulate certain organs, but by default of stimulations, other organs are diminishing. And this increase of organs, of diminution of organs, are transmitted to the next generation. So at each generation, individuals seem to fit, their function seems to fit, excuse me, their, their structure, their, their form, seems to fit the functions they, they uh, accomplish. And so on. So please uh, note, please remember that here, variation occurs to the need of the user. Because it is by an effort that is made by the user that the variation is occurring. Okay. In Darwin, it's, it's slightly different. It's slightly different 50 years ago, uh, 50 years after. Um, you have a diversity of individuals here, a diversity of individuals. Variation occur independently of the needs of the one that is going to, 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 to uh, that is submitted to the effects. Um, Darwin does, doesn't really look at, at um, the initiation of, various, of variations by themselves. Um, he, he, he writes that it's, it's useless to do that because if you do that, you will be lost. You mean, if you are interested, if you try to explain each variation occurring, each, each character of each individual in a population, you, you will be lost you need to separate the questions. Okay, okay, variation is occurring. Okay, what is the result? My, my, my focus is what is the result at the scale of the population. I don't need to know exactly how variation occur. It's, it's occurring, it's, it's, it's just a, a matter of observation. But what, what is the resulting effects at the scale of the population? So this is a, the way the, the question is put uh, by Darwin. Some individuals, just by chance, have 
variation that tends to diminish the number of, uh, of offspring. Other variations would be inclined to increase the number of offspring. So the favorable variation will, be, will accumulate along the lineage because just, just because they, they allow individuals to, put, to do more offspring. And at the end, in the lineage, favorable variations will be, uh, will be accumulated. And this is the way he explains the fit between forms and functions. You, you, you obtain a, 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 an impression of design without designer, if, if I can say. Uh, the difference between the two authors is that here the variation uh, seems to occur uh, for the benefit of the individual. Here the variation occurs independently of the needs of the individuals. So some of these vari those variations will, will make individuals perish. And indeed, there is death. If you see this reasoning, uh, this is uh, the one uh, that is validated today. Um, uh, you, have to, you, you, you have to keep in mind that in, in evolution, it, it, it is counterintuitive for us. In evolution, if you need the lineage to be maintained, you need individual to die, because you have to renovate, you have to renovate the, the, the variations. Variations is a kind of uh, assurance for the, for the future, if I can say. Um, variation is, is, a, is a, the fuel, is fueling uh, the evolutionary engine. So if you have, a, if you have a variation, you have a, 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 some probability that the lineage will, will, will be maintained through time. Variation and death makes um, the perennity of, of a lineage. So the difference between the two authors uh, is not about inheritance of characters gained, gained during the individual life. You know, uh, neither Lamarck nor Darwin knew anything about the way we transmit characters to, next, to the next generation. This is not the point. The point is between the two authors. I, I'm, I'm saying that because in the papers you will find all you will, you will often find this claim that for, for Lamarck uh, there is a, a transmission of the experience of the individual to the next generation and not for Darwin, which is not accurate historically. Historically, the two authors admit that some changes that the individual uh, experienced during its, its own life will be transmitted to the, to the offspring. So the difference is not there. The difference is that here the variation occurs to the need of the, of the, of the individual and here independently of the need of the user. So what do we need to, 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 to have the natural selection? Uh, excuse me, uh, just a detail. O okay, you obtain stability here, or, or I, would, I should say regularity, regularity of a phenotype here. But don't, don't forget that there will be some change again. Uh, matter, by definition, matter doesn't stop to change. Matter changes by definition. So you, you will have new colors occurring here. But per, trans, uh, f uh, during a transitory period, you will have uh, some beneficial uh, uh, variation that will be stabilized, that, uh, that are going to be stabilized in the population here. So what do we need to, to uh, basic properties for an entity to be submitted to natural selection, you have a variability, uh, it's, it's, it's clear. You don't need to explain how each variation occurs, you just have to, to, to see that there, there is a variability. This variability is tr variable uh, uh, characters are transmitted to the next generation whatever the, the way is transmitted. And if you have variability and transmission to an alter ego, alter, if I can say, you can have a drift. What does it mean, drift? 
it means that uh, in, the big, in the big population, different variations at the same character will be, uh, the, the frequencies will, will uh, be changing uh, just by chance, like that. In the big populations, it will explain part of the stability of what we call polymorphism different forms uh, for, uh, of uh, same characters to be maintained in a big population. In, in the small population, you will have uh, st um, stochastic effects. Uh, some characters that are beneficial will... It's possible that just by chance you have a beneficial character that disappear just because of uh, effects of... Um, uh, ah ça, j'ai un trou d'anglais là. Un tirage aléatoire, comment tu dis Random... Euh, random... Euh, draw Random draw, merci. <rire> random draw, or a, a, a slightly um, uh, deleterious characters could, can be fixed in the population just because, because of random effects. So, this, the effect of drift in the big population, a small population. To have natural selection, you, you need some constraints. And uh, this system is under constraints. These constraints explain why some variants will, will do more offspring of springs than others. So if you have this descriptive variability, transmission and constraints, you, you have natural selection. So um, the question, the interesting question for not only for biologists, but for scientists in general, is that each time we meet an entity that is varying, that is transmitting the variation to an alter ego and uh, under constraint, it's possible that this entity is submitted to natural selection. Uh, today, uh, we think about that for languages, uh, not only today, it, to, for two centuries ago, but. Uh, for, for, for in, in terms of natural selection, more recently, uh, languages, uh, cultural items, cells within the same body, uh, proteins, uh, and so on. So, um, proteins, because uh, uh, I, I, I won't have the time to go into details uh, on that, but um, um, there, this paper just came out last month, and uh, it explained that uh, proteins are very good candidates for prebiotic world, uh, accompanying uh, certainly accompanying uh, nucleic acids, uh, but but with a certain precedence that is explained in, even in the abstracts. Uh, there are there are very interesting molecules that were neglected during 60 years, as a, as a main actor of. Uh, of what we call prebiotic e evolution. Why? Because you can find in a certain circumstances this triptych uh, obtained for proteins that can transmit to each other um, three, three dim dimensional conformations uh, to uh, an alter ego. There is no, uh, there are no cells here. There are no, no, no sex, uh, no stuff like that, you know, just proteins to proteins. But uh, we will go back uh, in this, in, on this model later, nat um, later if you want to. Uh, two remarks about this triptych. Uh, there, are some big, there have been big changes in the transmission module during the last uh, years. Um, this is a paper I took from uh, Lalande's team explaining the new extended evolutionary synthesis that, uh, that uh, Lalande is uh, promoting today. Uh, I will summarize uh, the situation as he's, he's, he's doing it. Uh, in an in old scheme, the scheme I, I learned at school, um, you transmit from one generation to the next generation on, almost only with the genome. What is transmitted from one generation to the next is, uh, is uh, the DNA of the sexual uh, uh, cells. Uh, the inheritance is, is uh, genetic inheritance mainly with uh, sexual cells. 
And uh, in the genome, you have what we, a metaphor that we that was back to the to the 60s, the early 60s, the metaphor of genetic program. And if you say that there is a genetic program, the development itself is the development of a program that is already written. So uh, you are unfolding, development is seen as an unfolding of something that is already uh, written at a small scale. This is the scheme uh, as I was, this is the way I, 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 I learned biology to last third of the 20th century. The new version of this scheme, uh, the today's version, is a slightly slightly different but, but is very important. That first of all, from one generation to the next, you don't transmit only DNA from the genome. You transmit far more things, actually, at different scales of organization. From genome to genome, obviously, it's, that's, that's true, that's true, but you also transmit from cell to cell because eggs, uh, there are cytoplasm in eggs and there are factors that uh, have a certain impact in the cytoplasm of eggs. You transmit from, from, from the organism to the, to the cell with epigenetic inheritance, you transmit from organism to organisms, you're transmitting behaviors, you're transmitting habits, you're transmitting uh, uh, food culture, for instance, that retrow select populations. Good examples about milk, human population drinking milk. You transmit from organisms to the environment because some species construct environments that regulates physical factors Back, re uh, back selecting populations sub uh, submitted to the, to the environment. Termites, for instance, social insects, construct um, buildings where temperature, hygrometry, and, uh, and uh, other factors that are controlled. And the new generations are not living outside, they are living under the condition, physical condition constructed by, constructed by the previous generations. I'm thinking about those, those, those nests of uh, uh, South African birds. Names of the birds is um, uh, social republicans. Funny names for birds. Why? Because they, they live together. They, they, they are several hundreds of birds building a, a nest of several tons in, in a tree or in a, in a structure. Uh, the, the, the nest is, is, is up. And there are uh, tens and tens of chambers, and in chambers of the nests, the temperature uh, and the shade is protecting uh, the birds from the hot temperatures of the desert because it's the Kalahari's desert, uh, southwest Africa. And uh, they all constructing nests. They all constructing condition unto which the eggs and the next generation will be will be will, will be will be raised. I mean. So the nests are fresher during the day and hotter during the night. So uh, birds are better like that. And those nests can uh, rest for uh, more than one century. So tens of years, but also tens of, of um, centuries of uh, occupying the same nest. So the, the niche construction, that is called niche, uh, ecological niche construction, is constructed by the species itself. So the species is participating to its own condition of selection. This is the, 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 the meaning of this, this arrow here. Uh, the individuals construct environments that is transmitted to the next generation. So we don't transmit only DNA for, for, from, for, from, the, from the germ cells. This is the, the, the lesson we, we learn from. And to finish with that, what is changing is that genes do not control anything. Genes don't, they're just impulse. This is a very, di very important difference of word. You always hear everywhere that genes control uh, the, the embryonic di development. And there is a genetic program, you know, there is no program at all. Genes just impulse, poop. And there is a cascade of events where environment interfere. 
So the, the embryonic dev development is not the unfolding of a program, it's uh, construction by itself. So from the genome to the, to the organism, it's not a, an unfolding of a program, it's the individual is just constructing, constructing itself. Genes are not controllers, they are partners, which is a different way to speaking about biology, but a, a, a re, more rich way to speak about the way genes act in, actually. So I will be back on that in, in a few minutes later. So I'm, I'm going back now about what w natural selection explains. Um, this game between stability and change, you find it during the history of, na of uh, natural history. The talk was about history, about evolution, so we need to to un understand what was about this, this game, about, you know, the ones who see similarity and the ones who see change. For Linnaeus, as I said, the given to be observed by the humans was the species. Species were real. We call that, in epistemology, taxonomic realism. The, the boxes you're constructing in your mind, you think that they do really exist in nature. And it was the situation for, 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 for Linnaeus. Linnaeus considered that the species was cre were created by, uh, by God. God is a factor that explains the stability of species or the regularity of species. Here you have, in this column, you have uh, what explains. Here in this column, you have what is to be explains. Explained. You have to explain similarity or regularity, if you prefer. And what is given to your eyes is the species. So you read the, 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 the table like that. Uh, God explained the regularity of species. Okay. Going, go, go now to the 19th century. If you go to the 19th century, I summarize obviously, but uh, in 1895, this book is, come out, is coming out, and you know, uh, you, you know this title, it's, it's famous, but I, I would like to focus on the subtitle. The main book of Darwin, The Origin of Species. Between the origin of similarity, the origin of species, the origin of similarity. This is the way Darwin asked the question. And he answered the question not with the word evolution, not with the word transmutation, not with the word transformation. He answered the question with the word preservation. It's about the origin of similarity. The preservation of favored races, uh, you have to understand the word races uh, not in the way you, you understand it in this century. You, you, you need to read the variation here. You need to understand variation here. The preservation of favored variations, if you prefer, in the struggle for life. So it's not about evolution, it's about preservation. So you have to understand that uh, what is to be explained by Darwin is regularity at the, at the, at the short term. Natural selection explains the regularity or the similarity, if you prefer, of individuals. And with the regularity of individuals, you do species. It's species do not exist. See, you do species because you have to name it. You have to name the things that are there out, outside. Species are just linguistic conventions. That Darwin clearly says that in his text. He says, uh, I, it's funny, uh, I, I'm laughing about species because my colleagues are not, do not agree each other about the way a species should be uh, should be made uh, among the variation of life. Or, or, still today, you have uh, controversies about uh, the way you have to, to cut a variation into different species. Uh, different specialists do not necessarily agree. It's not so obvious. If you look at a cat and a giraffe, it is obvious. I, <laughs> I agree on that. But if you do research in taxonomy, you really quickly understand that it's not obvious. So species are the way you are cutting the biodiversity 
to be able to, uh, to speak about that. So it is nominalism, it is Darwin's nominalism. Natural selection explains the regularity of the similarity of individual, or the short term. At the short term, natural selection is conservative. You will understand that if you look, look, if you look at the long term, the environment will, will change one day or another. And if the environment is changing, the, the variations that are selected by the environmental factors, th this, th these vari those variations will not be the same. So the mean of the population will change. So on the, on the long term, I agree that natural selection explains how what we call a species change, do change. I agree on that, but we forgot in the 19th century, in the second half of the 20th century, we forgot that for Darwin, at the first, gl at the first glance, natural selection explains the, it's the origin of similarity. There are consequences of this uh, blank during the 20th century. Uh, this cons the consequences is, for instance, about cancer. Cancer. You, 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 you may wonder why, but I, I will explain you. <laughs> it's, not difficult, it's not difficult to understand. Before going to cancer, let's have a look to Ernst Mayer. Ernst Mayer is a, an ornithologist of the 20th century. Uh, and um, he's a main, uh, one of the main actors of what we call uh, theoretic, uh, the evolutionary synthesis of, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, I won't explain what, what is the evolutionary synthesis. Just, just consider that there is some degree of uh, cons consensus uh, achieved uh, during the 50s and 60s about evolution. And Mayer was uh, one of the main actors of this consensus of, about what evolution is. But the main point I would like to address here is that for, for Mayer, species are real. So there is no God here anymore. Why? Because uh, the, the deal for science is not to, to speak about metaphysics anymore. It was the, it was the case in Linnaeus' time. You know, science were, were, were performed by Western Europeans under the control of churches. You know that. But it's not the case anymore in the, in the, in the 19th century and 20th century. So, there is no, nothing about God here. Uh, you, have to, you have to find a natural explanation of natural phenomena. It is a new deal of science at the, at the articulation between... Uh, it was, it, it was, it's not just like that, you know. It, 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 took, it took an entire century to be, uh, to be achieved, but it was during the, uh, the, the 18th century. Uh, so, uh, for Mayer, natural selection, explains the change of species. Why? Because spe species is a given. It is what I said before. If you see here similarity, species do exist, you have to explain the change of, of the similarity that is existing. Okay? This is a, the way Mayer put the emphasis. On, on this understanding of uh, the main, uh, the main, w the, 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 the way evolution should be talked. The reason wa was because Mayer was an um, ornithologist and he has a biological definition of species where species were understood as, as um, uh, a network of population uh, exchang exchanging genes. Mer looked at nature in, in the very thin layer of time, you know. And you cannot do biology if you look only at the thin layer of time. Many, many biological phenomena can be, or structures could be understand, can be understand, only fully understand if you take history into consideration. And, um, if you look at, uh, at a thin layer of time, you have the illusion that, that species are real. Obviously, you know that uh, dogs do not make babies with cats. 
anyone here outside to, to say, oh, species are real. Okay, elephants do not make babies with giraffes, so uh, species are real. But you cannot do biology, biology in a thin, on, only thin layer of time. You need the, the depth of time to understand biological entities. Yeah, many, uh, many of your own organs, the form of your organs, can be understood only through history. You can understand your, or, uh, some of your organ, organs cannot be understood only for, from physical uh, I mean, explanations. Um, you, have you heard about, for instance, uh, the um, uh, aorta, the main aorta, out, the, the, the main canal outside, outside the, 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 the heart? You have a pump, the heart, and the main, the main canal that going outside it makes a, 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 a loop of uh, upside down loop, upside down loop, at, at, just at the, at, the, at the output of the, of the heart, you know. I would have been would have constructed the the, 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 the art. I will put the, the art in the, other, in the other way, upside down, to have the the blood to be to be sent right from the beginning uh, downstairs. But it's up, and it makes a loop like this, and you can understand the loop only by doing the history of the the circulatory system, the palatological the paleontological long term history. Of the, of the circulatory system. And you understand why there is a loop there. Otherwise, you don't understand the loop. If you are an engineer, you said, oh, well, what do you do? Just put the, the, the heart upside down and you have, you, have the, you have the job done. Okay. So, uh, two actors of the uh, 20th century synthesis, uh, Mayer and Simpson. Simpson, the paleontologist, uh, as a paleontologist, has to consider the depth of time. And if you have depth of time in mind, you have, to say, you have to consider that at one day or another, the two lineages here, if there is a tree of life, and obviously the two guys are Darwinian, they think that biodiversity today is explained on the, in the depth of time, is explained by a, a tree of life. If there is a tree of life, the two lineages at one moment or another could, should, 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 uh, should, uh, should meet. Uh, if you go fr from the present to the past, the two lineages should, uh, should meet. And here, what species do you have? Species are just conventions. So uh, it's not animals here, elephants and giraffes. Here, you don't, you don't have an elephant. You don't have a giraffe. You have something in between. I don't know what, but uh, something, something in between. Oh, okay. If you, if you have an elephant here, explain why it, it, it doesn't change in the giraffe's branch. Oh, sorry, in the elephant <laughs> branch, and it changes in the giraffe's branch. If you have a giraffe here, you have to explain why there is a change in the elephant's br branch and uh, why uh, there is no change in the giraffe's branch. So if you have something in between, there have been changed in the, in the two branches. Anyway, what you have here is a different form that you cannot name the same way as uh, here, later. So only if you take the depth of time into consideration, you, you, you can uh, realize that species are conventional. And we have cut the tree of life that way. What is a species actually? A species is, is a portion of genealogical flow until the flow is undivided. When it becomes divided, you, you have to change a name. The, 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 red, the red boxes are just linguistic boxes. But it's just linguistic boxes. It's not uh, something occurring in the real world. I mean, what, what is occurring real here just, is just a barrier of reproduction here. But uh, it's the only thing that occurs in nature. I mean, you, you, never, you never see uh, uh, Homo erectus mother giving birth to the human in, in her cave, as in the film, you know, the movie, which is, which is stupid, it's, it's, it's actually uh, confusing uh, linguistic boxes with the real world is confusing uh, concepts with, with entities that the concept is supposed to, to explain. 
you will never have a homo erectus mother giving birth to a human. It's homo sapiens sapiens. Oh, it's written on this. Oh, a new species, you know. You document, put in another way, you document new species only when you document a barrier of reproduction. It's just that. And this is the, the criterion under which you will name differently the two uh, 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 um, um, daughter branches. Okay. In the 21st century, we go back to Darwin. Natural selection explains the regularity of individuals. There are consequences, as I said. There are consequences, uh, in, 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 even for uh, public health of this. It's not a, an uh, abstract uh, epistemology. I mean, there are real practical consequences that because natural selection was priorly considered as a factor of change, medical science never imports natural selection into the body. Because medical science need to fix sickness, need to fix uh, ill bodies. And the normal body is a body that is functioning. Is, that is functioning. When, you when it doesn't function, you, you, you fix it and you are okay. So you, you need a factor of stability uh, to explain how uh, a normal body is functioning normally. So you don't need a factor of change. You need a factor of stability. But natural selection was not considered as a factor of stability. It was only considered as a factor of change. So medical sciences did, didn't need, didn't feel to need a natural selection as an explain, explanative uh, factor of what happens in, in, into a body. When I was a student like you, uh, natural selection was for individuals of a, of, a, of a species. It was not supposed to be imported into the body. So uh, we manage some sickness, for instance, uh, cancer, with tools, intellectual tools, where uh, the factor of stability was not natural selection, it was the genetic program. During the 20th century, the genetic program was a stabilizing factor that took the place of natural selection. Because we put natural selection outside, we had to explain stability, and we did it with genetic program. The genetic program was made to explain repeatability of an uh, embryonic development and stability. Order became causal. If you use a metaphor like Ernst Mayer did, or like Monod did, or uh, Jacob also did in 1961, if you're using a metaphor of a program, uh, you are considering that the, the, the internal body, the stability of the body is, um, is, is maintained by uh, a regularity that is causal. The cause of the stability and the regularity of the body is a program. And program is giving instructions. There is a genetic program, there is genetic control also. Uh, the development uh, was unfolding what we call a body plan. And body plan was maintained by architect genes. All these metaphors are instructionist metaphors. Orders are already written in something small and you just need the moment to unfold what is already written. This kind of thinking as a name in the history of science, it's pre-formationism. Pre-formationism, pre-formationism, what is going to occur, what is going to come out, is already formed at a small scale. Like uh, Artswicker's uh, microscopes here uh, in uh, 1694, at the beginning of the microscopes, Hartswicker had the illusion to, uh, to see an homunculus inside a spermatozoa. 
and he, he, he draw uh, the homunculus. Why do the, the, the offspring uh, look like their parents? Because there is an homunculus here, it may, to make it short. Yeah. And for, to my eyes, uh, of, I, I am a biologist, so to my eyes, the genetic programs were, was during the 20th century functioning more or less like this. Uh, if you look at the late decades of the 20th century, people started to uh, uh, make some... Um, uh, the program was not so, 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 so strong. It was strong at the beginning in the 60s and 70s, but we, when you go to the 90s, they became to say, OK, it's not really a program. The, pro the program is, uh, is soft. The program is uh, adapt adaptative. And the program is, is so there was some um, change in the way the program was seen. But basically, basically the metaphor was not appropriate for explaining uh, the regularity of uh, what happened. In biology, order is not causal. It, it is. It is make the, It's the main difference between chemistry and biology. Order is what you need to explain, because biology is science of variation. Bi biology deals with entities that are individually, historically unique. All individual here is unique, you know that. But if I look at each of your cells, today we are able to, to detect it with different tools, very highly sophisticated tools. We know that uh, cells from one cell to another there are mu uh, somatic mutations that, you, for instance, the DNA of uh, two of your cells are not strictly identical. Identity is not part of biology. Identity is an idealistic uh, representation of mathematical representation of the world, but it doesn't concern biology. Even two uh, uh, siblings are different. Let me tell you a story. Uh, in the French Institute of Agronomy, they just cloned uh, two, cow two cows. They took the eggs, the, 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 they took the egg at, at the first cell step stage. At the two cell stage, they separated the, the cells. So you know what happens in that, that, that situation. The two cells restart the embryonic development and you have true siblings. You have two siblings, but at the end, the adult cows uh, didn't have the same. Uh, uh, stems? Litache à la surface de la robe. Stems? Ah, stains, okay. Oui. The two cows didn't have the same stains uh, on, on, their, on, on their fur. So it, it means that. It means that um, genes uh, do not do uh, everything, obviously. And, uh, and what you need to explain is, uh, is order, actually. Order is not causal. Is order is what you need to explain. Because biology is science of variation. You, each entity, each cell you, you, you have, as an, an original uh, uh, history. So uh, my, my lesson is that uh, order is what you need to explain. Regularity or uh, similarity emerges from a filtered variation. So you could replace in biology some of the words we, we, we used in the second half of the 20th century. Okay. Uh, the genetic program, there, the, there is impulses in a genome, I agree with that. But it, it, it's not a control, it's an impulse. Instructions, you can replace it by construction. The genetic program, you can replace it by construction, actually. And uh, today, uh, many geneticists will, will, will acknowledge the fact that environment interfere into the conditions of expression of genes. So if you, if you say that environment interfere, there is no program at all. Or I, would mean, I would say program is not an appropriate metaphor. Uh, there is no genetic control, there is a genetic impulse. 
there is no body plan. We have a mos you have a phylogenetic mosaic. And you, when you gain something uh, at, at, uh, on the long term, uh, in evolution, when you gain some organs, you can lose it secondarily. Obviously, snakes have lost their legs. Uh, we have, we have, we have uh, remains of legs in, the, in some snakes, but uh, just by saying that, I mean, there is no plan. Plan is a, is a rigidification of, uh, of a combination of characters, but there is no rig, 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 rigidified combination of character in nature. Characters can be lost independently of others. It is a mosaicism, evolutionary mosaicism, if I can say. You have lost your tail. Your primate tail is lost. You made a coccyx with it. Well, I, I won't multiply the examples, but uh, there is no plan. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, unless you, you need to learn your, your zoology lesson. But um, There are no architect genes. They are just early impulses. Ox genes, or the genes that determine body plans, it's, is there important why? Just because the they, they main effects are early during the development. So it, obviously, if you perturb this, those genes, the consequences are important. But it's just because they are early, it's just because they are architects. Should, I don't know if you feel the difference of, of the way you speak about biology. And so to today, to, to finish with this part, uh, the two pillars of evolution are entered now into the body. Today it's made now. The two, what are these two pillars? The natural selection and descent. Natural selection, you, in, in a few words, you, you have understood. Descent is just this idea that things you are looking at today is, is uh, the product of a genealogy. Today, if you look at the literature, for instance, about cancer, uh, evolutionary principles are used to uh, treat cancer. Look at nature here in 2016. Tumors, cancerous tumors, are subject to the same rules of natural selection as any other living things. Clinicians are now putting that knowledge into use. Uh, the, the journal Pour, Pour la Science made an entire uh, issue about uh, evolution against cancer. Use the evolutionary way of thinking to treat uh, con uh, t uh, tumors, cancerous tumors. Like that, for instance, uh, Gattenby exp is explaining that uh, nicely in this pour la science or in a uh, scientific American, uh, the corresponding American journal. You have a tumor here, each cell, each cell is different, each cell of your body is different any, any, anyway. But you have more variation into a cancerous tumor than anywhere else in, into the body. You have uh, resistant cells uh, in green and sensitive cells in, uh, in brown, sensitive to, the, to the, the treatment, the molecules. And what we did in the past, because we thought that what a cell should do by default was to be maintained, was to be quiet, and being proliferative is a sickness. This is the way we thought in the past. Today, we think the reverse. The natural situation for a cell is to be proliferative. And the fact that it, it doesn't proliferate is, is a, a control, a kind of control by, by the other cells, you know. So to be proliferative is not a sickness. It's natural to be proliferative. Every biological entity does that, even us. The, uh, or biological entities are still here today because they were proliferative, uh, because they are still proliferative. There, there many more uh, biological entities gives birth, are born than, than, than the number of, of them that can able to, to survive in, the, in an environment. You need variation, so you need proliferation to be a lineage to be maintained. This is the way biology is thinking. So cells are not quiet by default, they are proliferative by default. You put uh, 
a maximum dose, this is the, the old way of thinking, uh, tr cancer treatment, you put the maximum dose in, 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 in a, a, so that you can eliminate sensitive cells, so you, you diminish drastically the size of the tumor, but doing that you always leave some of the cells, you, know, you cannot kill all of them. It's like antibiotics, you know, you cannot kill all of them. There are always a, a small number that are still here because there is variation. Biology is science of variation. And you have made room for the, 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 so the small number of the resistant ones to start again to proliferate. So the, the tumor is uncontrollable anymore and you kill the patient. Not always, obviously, not always, but in a certain, an important proportion of patients are killed by, by metastases uh, obtained by uh, the, the restart of the, of, the, of the proliferation of the small number of ones that were resistant here. And the evolutionary treatment is, is to take into account that proliferation is by default. So what you need is to, is, is to maintain a kind of ecosystem that uh, prevent the ones that are resistant to proliferate. Here you free uh, the limits and you allow the resistant one to proliferate because you have eliminated the environment. Here you maintain the environment, so you kill, a number, you kill only a small number of, 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 of them, but each time you, you, you put a treatment, the cells between them are, are in a need to renegotiate their position into the tumor. And so the tumor, the tumor has its size to, that is diminished, not, not completely uh, eradicated, but just diminished, but it's, it's maintained uh, quiet. So this is how Gattenby and his team explain uh, um, uh, treat a uh, patient with um, pro prostatic cancer and they have um, uh, a scores of uh, four or five times the time of uh, survival of the, of the patients with this, with this kind of, uh, of treatment. So the evolutionary thinking is, is taken into account into the body now and it has consequences in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in medical sciences. And to finish with the two pillars, interest, the phylogeny, the, the, actually the, the descent, the reason, descent reasoning, is into the body. Just look at this paper that came out in Science in, in few, a few, few years ago, 2018. They took transcriptomes from, different, from cells of, at different stages of development of a zebrafish embryo uh, in the 24 first hours. And they compare the transcriptomes and they could re reconstruct the phylogeny of the development of the tissues. So you have a phylogeny of a, a developing organism. So you, you have uh, descent into the body. So the second pillar of the theory of evolution is, is into the developing body. And we, and this, we discover here, for instance, that me, what, we, oh, what, we, what is mesoderm Mesoderm is paraphyletic. We, we have learned at school that in the primitive stages of embryos, you have three layers, ectoderm, endoderm, or mesoderms in the between. And mesoderms are paraphyletic because they give birth to endoderm. Endoderm that, 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 that generates later the digestive tract. And what is surprising is that if you look at the same thing for, uh, for um, a frog, for a frog, the mesoderm is monophyletic here. So the way the primar primary layers of the embryo are not developing the same way in a fish and in a frog, which is very surprising for, 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 for the zoologist, you know. Uh, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm was supposed to be something very stable. Uh, same example in, in, in an oak, I, I won't in go into details. Here in the human, so I finish with this, uh, this uh, summary. Regularity from order was used during the 20th century to explain how we obtain an individual. It was the ontogeny, as the ontogeny was unfolded by a genetic program. And to explain the regularity of what we are doing as a, 
what, what we call a species, the regularity was explained from disorder with natural selection. The biology during the 20th century was schizoid in a way. You had a theory to explain the stability of the species and another theory that is what different from the, from the previous one to explain the stability of individuals. And this is what we call the phylogeny here and ontogeny here. Here, regularity was obtained from an order. You will do that. And here, from um, selecting a, a fundamental disorder. So if you, if you try to make biology self-consistent, you, you don't consider that in biology you explain order by order. You have to, you, you have to explain order by, by a fundamental disorder. So the, the filtering of a fundamental disorder, which, which what natural selection is doing actually. So you transfer a natural selection into the individual. And so you have what we call a, a natural selection explaining the regularity of individuals and explaining the regularity of a species. This is what we call uh, Jean-Jacques Cupiec's ontophalogenesis. Phylogeny and ontogeny is the same phenomenon. And ev the evolution is within the developing body. Evolution is within the body, actually. And it's still in your body because today we understand aging with the tools of evolution. Aging is a an evolutionary phenomenon. Ontophilogeny. So this is the conclusion of the of the first part of my talk. Uh, thank you.